what are technical limits and why should people be interested in, in whether this affects their project? Timescales for connections have just strung out now to sort of the mid to late 2030s. Technical limits are a potential way of bringing forward connection dates to potentially a much more sensible time frame. When distributed generation connects onto the, the distribution networks, it inevitably has an impact on the transmission system. Um, or there could be impacts on the wider transmission system. That's really where we've seen these really long connection dates coming in. Technical limits are a bit of a sort of holding pen solution. So can we connect customers prior to reinforcements happening? Uh, there's other things going on in the background, like the ESO's five-point plan, modeling batteries in different ways, but we still don't really know the outcome of that yet. So, so the technical limits are a bit of a holding position to say, can we get customers connected earlier? Hello and welcome to the Connectology podcast. Here, Road Knight Taylor's influential team of elite connection specialists and their expert guests help you to better understand distribution and transmission network connections and how to acquire them faster, for less cost and at lower risk. Good afternoon and welcome to Road Knight Taylor's podcast on technical limits and the limitations of technical limits. We are recording this in the wild, so to speak, um, from our team away day at the Science Museum in Rawton. Uh, I'm Catherine Cleary and I'm joined by fellow connectologists Nikki Pillinger, Philip Bale and Pete Aston. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Okay, so first up, this is a bit of a techie subject, so we're probably going to try and keep it relatively straightforward and focused on the impact for project developers. So, Pete, if I can pick on you, what are technical limits and why should people be interested in, in whether this affects their project? So if I start with the why could this be interesting, at the moment, as most developers will know, timescales for connections have just strung out now to sort of the mid to late 2030s. So technical limits are a potential way of bringing forward connection dates um, to potentially a much more sensible time frame, certainly in the 2020s. That sounds good. <laughs> as opposed to the 2030s. That's the sort of the main reason, the main headline is earlier connection dates. Um, so what are technical limits? When distributed generation connects onto the, the distribution networks, um, it inevitably has an impact on the transmission system. So that could be on the grid supply point itself, so the 400 to 132 kV transformers or, or something like that, the interface substation between national grid transmission and the distribution companies. Um, or there could be impacts on the wider transmission system um, and that's really where we've seen these really long connection dates coming in with the, the cumulative impact of everything at distribution level and directly connected transmission generators, triggering loads of reinforcement on the transmission system and hence getting loads of really long connection dates. So, so that, that's, that's the general background that I think everyone's really aware of. So technical limits are a bit of a sort of holding pen solution to, to say, well, um, what can you do before the reinforcement work happens? So can we connect customers prior to reinforcements happening? Uh, there's other things going on in the background, like the ESO's five-point plan, where they're looking at modeling batteries in different ways, which might mean some of these wider reinforcement works aren't required at all, uh, but we still don't really know the outcome of that yet. So, so the technical limits are a bit of a holding position to say, can we get customers connected earlier? Um, so essentially, what it will um, involve is the, the transmission companies giving a technical limit, so probably a megawatt limit at a grid supply point to say, you can push out X megawatts from this grid supply point and no more. I suspect it'll be a little bit more complicated than that. But you know, the transmission gives the, the DNO some limits to stick to a, a particular grid supply point. And then the DNO can connect people to that grid supply point, provided that they then limit the power flow at that grid supply point to a certain level. Okay. And so if we've got DNOs being effectively given this megawatt headroom, and, and as I understand it, this might be an increased megawatt headroom compared to what they have, have had before. Um, so in, in terms of things like Appendix G materiality thresholds that, we, that we've maybe talked about before. Um, Nikki, have we sort of got to the bottom yet really of, of how are DNOs going to distribute that headroom? How are they going to decide which projects can perhaps move forward and accelerate their connection dates? Um, in theory, yes. In practice, um, it, it does worry me slightly. 
So the um, the initial premise for this was um, that shovel-ready sites would be able to connect. So part of the ENA's plan is that the first ready, first connect um, premise instead of ha- instead of having this sort of queuing system. Um, the definition of shovel-ready sites was that you've got planning, that you've got an ICP on board, and that you've got your detailed design, that you've got financial close. And in reality, there are very, very few sites that would have done this if they've got a you know, a, a connection date of 2030, whenever. Mm. So that sort of was quite quickly brought back to uh, sites that potentially got planning. Again, very difficult because if you know you've got a very long connection date, then you're not going to have gone and got planning for your site. So it kind of remains to be seen how the DNOs will allocate this capacity. It will be to sites that are more progressed. So um, quite a lot of developers are now thinking, oh, you know, we're going to to gear up to doing this uh, in case we are allowed to, you know, connect under these technical limits. But in practice, I think it will be very, very challenging for them to do that. I think it's probably worth saying as well, I didn't, I should have mentioned, the DNO is going to implement these technical limits effectively via like active network management or DERMS as, as UKPN call it. And so so basically to fit within this technical limits headroom that the, the DNO is going to be given, um, the DNO will basically be curtailing customers. So from the point of view of the connected customer, it just looks like a curtailed connection. It's just you're curtailed for not only potentially distribution um, constraints, but you'll be going to be curtailed for constraints at the GSP and maybe even on the wider transmission system as well. So obviously that would look fantastic at some of the big GSPs where they have really large embedded synchronous generators, often historically been peak lopping type customers, so whether that be Grendon or Walpole, where there's multiple hundreds of megawatts worth of generators that historically have operated for tens of hours in a year, that could unlock a lot of capacity for the DNO to allow other customers to connect in. Obviously the risk for those customers is that the previous embedded channel customers could change their operating regime and then those customers could see significantly higher constraints. So Philip, are you saying that really there are GSPs where this strategy might work a lot better than others? Absolutely. So I think ultimately for some GSPs where they are have significant amounts of headroom in part two, potentially because they've had customers that have accepted no milestones, couldn't technically remove them from the queue, but haven't built out, that unlocks a significant amount of headroom for the DNO to reorder the queue and ultimately to provide people connections earlier. I think where it's going to be very difficult is at sites where there's very little already in part two or there's very little existing connected generation that their change could operate. So there's very little headroom that can be used by people. So I think in some sites, there's significant low-risk opportunities for developers to go ahead with. For other sites, I'm concerned that on paper there'll be capacity, but in reality, it would be very difficult for a generator to reach financial close with the significant uncertainty, especially where that generator may still have significant one-off costs if ultimately National Grid still decides they need to build new assets that they will be on the hook for both the securities and a share of the capital contributions, which could change significantly depending on how many people ultimately connect. So that, that, that's a really good point, actually, in terms of cost. This is an initiative really to try and solve connection timeframe issues. It doesn't help with connection charges. So customers who are facing really significant costs for transmission connection assets, you know, even if you're connecting to the local DNOs network, that's not going to change. At the moment, no, I think those developers will be pinning their hopes on the five-point plan in terms of coming in the future and reassessing things with a different view, a different technical planning assessment that could avoid some of those works for some customers, depending on ultimately what the decisions are made and how much diversity they can be unlocked. Um, But yeah, I think for some people, there could be a risk that they could get an accelerated connection, but still be liable for all of the significant costs associated with traditional reinforcement. So quite, quite a tricky investment decision potentially and and i suppose the um the time scales here because there is so much in flux in the industry you've mentioned the five point plan technical limits i think i'm right people will correct me i'm sure um came out of the three point plan the ena's three point plan yep. i think it was point number two transmission uh, interface um issues um so the timing is quite important for this um and the ENA had proposed that technical limits could be rolled out across the country in two phases. Um, So we know a bit more now potentially about what phase one versus phase two is going to look like. Am I right? Looking at sort of the low hanging fruit first in phase one. So that's going to be the simple grid supply points. So basically grid supply points 
where it's a connection asset site at the moment, so it only feeds one DNO. Um, so, so that is the the choice at the moment. GSPs where they're infrastructure sites and feed multiple DNOs or a DNO and some other customers, um, that's going to come in phase two. Also, they split out phase one to be um, connection, simple connection asset sites um, where there's no fault level problem uh, from connection asset sites where there is then a fault level problem as well on top uh, because they have to be dealt, looked at quite differently. Yeah, understood. And so understanding where your connection sits on the network, so which your relevant GSP is, and therefore whether your GSP is likely to be in phase one, phase one B, or phase two, um, sounds quite important. And we've we've just done a news and views podcast where Nikki's run us through some of the GSPs that we know are going to be included in phase one, but we're still waiting for more information for other DNOs, aren't we? We are, yes. So UKPN have made their initial announcement and Northern Power Grid have alluded to the amount of GSPs that will be in their phase one plan. And so it sounds a bit like phase phase one, by the way, I think anyone got an actual calendar date? I'm pretty sure the ENA had some sort of time graphs showing something kind of around Q3, Q4 this year. So a s- suggestion that those DNOs should be contacting customers in those GSPs um, within sort of timeframes of this year. Um, phase two, very much 2024 and and beyond possibly um so i, I i'm getting some nods as people check slides so it, it should be october that ah, um we're getting closer uh, so october for 1a so this is ukpn uh october for 1a and then november for 1b and this feels like a good time to take a break if you're liking this podcast so far you may want to pop over to the connectology page on road knight taylor's website and sign up to the connectology newsletter for much more know-how, insight, and thought leadership in electricity network connections. The link to this is in the description. Don't miss out on any of the articles, explainers, videos, webinars, and podcasts that Road Knight Taylor's connectologists share to give you an edge and help you overcome your grid frustrations. And welcome back, everybody. If, if we've got a site which is underneath a GSP, it sounds like it's probably worth doing some site-specific analysis of your own portfolio to, to find out, you know, are your GSPs or are your connections likely to be kind of offered accelerated connections or potentially offered accelerated connections in that first phase? Anything that you can do to kind of try and make it more likely? Nikki, you sort of touched on the DNOs allocating this on the basis of first ready, first served. So is it a case that actually really projects need to a, get a bit more ready, and B, tell their DNO that they're getting ready? <laughs> um, yeah, so I certainly uh, recommend constant contact with your DNO. Um, just that their visibility is really, really useful, actually, uh, in terms of them knowing what you're doing, in terms of them, know- them knowing that you're progressing, and then being in contact with them about, you know, the important the milestones that you're going through. And, you know, it's it's obviously a very, very challenging investment decision to you know, start putting projects through planning or start start a detailed design phase when you, you still don't have that clarity on your connection date. Um, but it is an approach that some developers are taking. And so I think there are things that consultants could do to try and help developers understand which of the sites that have the greatest potential of having capacity unlocked in terms of five-point plan, which of the sites that if they were to have the technical limits still wouldn't have the cost prohibitive cost risk associated with one-off costs where potentially you could sit in terms of the commercial risk, because obviously these are constrained connections, so you may well already have distribution constraints. This could be transmission constraints adding into it. Ultimately, what changes there could be on specific GSPs that could either reduce or increase the risk. And so I think there are things that consultants could do to try and help developers understand where is the risks, where's the opportunities, which schemes are going to have the greatest chance of accelerating earlier, and which schemes may still look very risky, even with five-point plan and technical limits coming through, that means that you might still struggle to reach financial close. I, I think it's worth mentioning as well that if a GSP that your scheme is on gets rolled out for technical limits, which effectively offers you earlier connection dates, and then you choose not to connect earlier, I think there could be a real risk of DNOs chasing up the milestones on those GSPs even harder than they do now, um, because they're essentially saying there are now no restrictions on you connecting. You don't have to wait till 2030 something. Oh, yeah, Uh, and uh, securities and liabilities and the impact that that will have. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So understanding securities and cancellation charges is is a massive part of this as well. Yeah. Um, as, as to when's the trigger date now? 
for you know wider wider cancellation charges um does, does that now get no one no forward? one knows i've asked that by the way um <laughs> so yeah I, I think there's potential risks of then not proceeding but i think also there's also i think what some developers will have to try and explain to their dnos is how can they model the financial risk because mm. ultimately if you have a scheme that is relatively marginal but if you wait out for the works to be done and you don't see the constraints that could come from the transmission system it's a viable scheme but if you have a scheme that is very heavily at risk of being constrained because of transmission um, limits then ultimately it would be the wrong thing for that scheme to do is to accelerate it and ultimately make a loss until those works are resolved as opposed to potentially waiting until the scheme is financially viable so customers should be given a choice whether to accelerate or not but what you're saying pete is that there is a risk that actually if they choose not to but they also therefore don't want to kind of continue down their development activities because they've got a connection date of 2038 that they might be penalized because they yeah. might get get struck out on the basis of milestones yeah one other really important point, we're sort of obviously technical limits um, and that three point plan have primarily been focused on accelerating generation connections. Um, are we expecting technical limits to cover import capacity at GSPs? You know, and is this something which demand customers should also be sort of picking up on? Because we might have quite a few more demand schemes which are shovel ready in that kind of definition um, of people who weren't expecting to be caught up in transmission constraints. I think potentially yes. I think the challenge is it's much harder for a demand customer to implement an active network management scheme on their site. So it's fairly easy if you're a battery with a large import capacity, you can you know you can just switch off at the drop of a hat. But if you if you're a data center or a you do, know, do you have that controllable demand you know, you, in the do, first place? Do you place? have controllable demand that you can just ramp down or switch off, um, or do you then have to go building in you know facilities in the background that can you know generation that can ramp up to uh, pick up your demand i think this is something that we're going to see far more and some demand customers being more astute than others in terms of going through obviously it'll have significantly more opportunities for non-final demand customers than final demand customers and of the final demand customers it will potentially have more opportunity for those that are more commercial and have flexibility options in terms of is there the opportunity for either data centers or large industrial commercial sites to use embedded generation so if they've got backup generation gas peaking plant type options for if there are outages can they use those to alter ultimately create that flexibility if it makes a significant impact to their business case. And that's certainly something outside of technical limits for demand. Road Knight Taylor are currently helping an industrial commercial customer unlock as much capacity on a distribution network using flexibility where everyone knows it exists. But at the moment, it's still quite a niche uh, process of going through and doing. I think it will still be the same niche thing from a transmission point of view, but still difficult for people to understand the risks and the impacts on their business case. I think in terms of um, which GSPs this is going to be, so I know Nick, Nikki previously mentioned the UKPN have published their list. I don't think many of the other DNOs have published their list. So if you're listening DNOs, please publish your lists as soon as possible of GSPs. I, I did note in the ENA's presentation that in Scotland, the, the rollout is going to be delayed slightly because in Scotland, typically there haven't been project progressions in the same way that there have been um, in England and Wales. And in Scotland, there's typically not Appendix Gs. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's going to be a requirement for the Scottish DNOs to apply, make project progressions and get the Penix G's in place before they can use technical limits. And and that is a that will be a slow process. Um, yeah. you know, as we've seen, that sort of tends to take a DNO at least at well, least six to nine based months. Based on the ENA's chart, that's going to all happen in August. Uh, you mean it's it, they've done it? Uh, well, apparently, yes. Wow, um, amazing, amazing work. <laughs> um, someone didn't get a summer holiday, clearly. Okay, so um, I think um. Sort of, you know, that, that that sounds like there is a huge amount for people to potentially digest on schemes. Quite a lot of technical complexity that might mean certain schemes are likely to benefit from this, in particular GSP areas compared to others. So the usual grid grid postcode lottery. Um, but that there are potentially things that, that that developers can do now to understand how likely they are to be able to make use of this, and therefore whether they should be kind of actively progressing those projects and trying to communicate with the DNOs. Um, so certainly sounds like something that's worth 
pursuing and maybe kind of considering for those projects which are stuck in transmission queues um, for, with, with these long grid connection dates. Thank you very much all. We will leave you um, to go and hopefully enjoy your sunny day. Uh, we are going to go and wander around uh, Rawton Solar Farm, uh, which we mentioned in another podcast, but which is Hugh Taylor's very first grid connection application, we think. Uh, so Rawton is a, 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 a 65 megawatt solar farm, which, which Hugh helped um, to get, get connected. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Connectology podcast. If you found it helpful, please share it with any of your colleagues or connections you think may be interested. And please do subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your content. You can find out more about our services at roadnighttaylor.co.uk, link in the description, where you can also sign up to our free Connectology newsletter for more news and thought leadership in network connections. If, during this podcast, you found yourself wondering what it would be like to have a Road Knight Taylor connectologist in your life, please do email laura at roadnighttaylor.co.uk to find out how their game-changing skills and insight can change the game for you too.